Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces and champions of this fight. Let me start by thanking President Biden and the members of the White House for hosting us today and for their steadfast leadership over the past year. I also want to thank our extraordinary team at the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Admiral Rachel Levine, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Assistant Secretary Lois Pace, and so many other leaders who've helped the department improve the health and well-being of the American people. And finally, I want to recognize the generation of activists, the game changers, the people who made things happen, who have made their voice heard in this fight against HIV over the years. People like Pedro Zamora, an HIV educator and television star who died of AIDS-related complications back in 1994. Before his passing, Pedro asked the world a simple question. He said, I wonder now, as I look around me, who is going to pick up my torch? Today, we are still fighting to end the HIV epidemic, but we have not let Pedro's torch extinguish. Nor have we forgotten the 36 million people with Pedro who died from AIDS-related illness around the globe. As Secretary of Health and Human Services, I'm proud to lead a department and serve in an administration that is confronting the HIV epidemic head on. Look no further than the new national HIV AIDS strategy that President Biden released today. Over the past few months, HHS has worked together with the White House and other agencies to develop a whole of society response to the HIV epidemic. This strategy provides a roadmap for ending the epidemic by advancing equity, expanding resources, and engaging those who have lived with this struggle, including gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, racial and ethnic minorities, especially African Americans and Latinos, transgender women, and heterosexual women, people who use drugs, and people experiencing homelessness or unstable housing. Health and Human Services will play a critical role in implementing this strategy. And we're already leading the way through the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S. Initiative, EHE. Like the new HIV strategy, the EHE initiative is focused on ending this epidemic by 2030. EHE, yes. My team said to me, you better get an applause after that one. So. <laughs> EHE will provide additional support to the 50 jurisdictions where more than half of the country's new HIV diagnoses occur, as well as seven states with a disproportionate occurrence of HIV in rural areas. And I will be working closely with my Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Rachel Levine, and the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS to support this new national strategy. Our HHS agencies will also continue to support the global fight to end HIV through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. We're working with countries around the world to train healthcare workers and improve detection, apply the latest research and safest medications and provide life-saving treatment to those in need. We're partnering with the World Health Organization and others to advance critical policies that will save lives. And last month, the United States announced that we will host the Global Fund's seventh replenishment conference. Back in June, the Department of Health and Human Services marked the 40th anniversary of the first official report about AIDS in 1981. There are a lot of young people who don't even remember what that was like, but there are still people who do. We have come a long way in the last four decades, but as this year's World Aid uh, Day theme reminds us, we still have plenty of work to do to ensure equitable access to HIV services and to end this epidemic. And we need everyone's voice to make that happen. We all have a role to play, whether we are in government, healthcare, 
the private sector, or community-based organizations. It's on us. On World AIDS Day, we remember all those we've lost, the faces in the frames, the names on the quilts, the millions gone way too soon. Let's honor them the best way we know how, by picking up that torch and keeping it burning. Now, I'm pleased to welcome one of those in our community, a community partner, one of those game changers I spoke about, a fellow Californian, and I better get some applause. <laughs> Gabriel Maldonado. As CEO of True Evolution, Gabe leads an organization that offers HIV prevention and care services. And we're thrilled that he, along with his incoming COO, who happens to be his mother, Marguerite, is here today and that they could join us with the president. Gabe is a true champion. Gabe is someone you're going to hear about for a long time. And, and Gabe is saving lives. And that's why he is here to get to introduce the president of the United States. Gabe, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you to Secretary Becerra for your generous introductions and for making the people of California very proud with your leadership. My name is Gabriel Maldonado, an LGBTQ and HIV advocate and the CEO of True Evolution, a community health and social justice organization serving Riverside and San Bernardino communities in California. I am honored to be here with you today as we celebrate World AIDS Day an opportunity to not only remember and honor the lives lost over the last 40 years, but to celebrate the lives living and thriving. The advocates, the healers, the freedom warriors who lead the work today. I founded True Evolution in 2007 when I was 18 years old to fight for health equity and racial justice to advance the quality of life and human dignity of LGBTQ people. At that time, platforms like this were scarce for people like me. It has certainly been a full circle moment to be here with you now, sharing a story that is not only my own, but represents millions of my brothers, sisters, siblings, who are part of the many vulnerable communities. It is especially the opportunity of a lifetime to be here before you today because my mother is here with me. She was my co-founder and backbone as we built True Evolution. And when the day came to navigate my own diagnosis with HIV, I waited through months of loneliness and guilt. I held a belief that somehow this new circumstance of life would make me unlovable. But mom said that this was all part of the mission, that life will give us experiences so that we may use them to find ourselves and our purpose. Her words would sustain me as I faced my own difficulties and disappointments when trying to access basic health services in my own community. Those experiences and her words inspired me to turn True Evolution into a direct service provider for the LGBTQ community, including those living with HIV and those at highest risk. Our mission was to create programs and services and deliver care to, for, and led by the people we wanted to serve as well as a place to employ and develop them. What began in a kitchen counter in my first apartment uh, is today an organization that provides comprehensive HIV care and prevention services, mental health, and emergency and permanent supportive housing. We celebrate our 14th year anniversary this month And it is all thanks to a team of 28 talented and committed individuals whom I have the profound privilege to work with. And later this month, we break ground on Project Legacy, a one and a quarter acre community campus that will be home to 49 beds of permanent supportive housing, a primary care center, mental health clinic, open park space for wellness and fitness programs. And I think for so many of us, who step into advocacy. 
we often begin in an effort to speak up for someone in our own home, a loved one, a friend, ourselves. And as a gay man, you discover along the journey the endless stories, experiences of struggle and challenge, of poverty, isolation, and injustice. And HIV has been and remains a very real part of the social and cultural experience for LGBTQ people in this country and around the world. Sitting at the center of many intersecting social issues, new rates of infection continue to be driven by factors such as poverty, lack of sexual health education, basic access to healthcare, homelessness, and cultural barriers and stigma. And there still remains so many people whom we've left within the margins. Indigenous and transgender, transgender communities, black and Latin folks, our youth, women, and the millions of people around this country who live in rural and underdeveloped areas. The field of HIV has before it an opportunity to itself to meet the public health needs of tomorrow. The ending of the HIV epidemic is an opportunity to not just focus on the volume of clients and the number of patients served, but to the quality of life and human dignity that we leave them with. This builds on a rich legacy as HIV response was first born out of community activism and has always recognized the intersections between HIV, human rights, and civil liberties. I am excited by the opportunity we have today under the leadership of President Biden with the release of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which outlines our collective national work to end the HIV epidemic the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and hopefully soon, the Build Back Better Act. We, we have a once in a generation moment to make the necessary investments for communities that have often been ignored telehealth and mobile services, the creation of new healthcare facilities, and expanded access to public transportation and roadways for those who live in geographic isolation. This will all help us to end the epidemic. I am grateful, very, very grateful for this moment to thank and send continued courage to President Biden and Vice President Harris in an era where political leadership requires renewed courage and on that note, it is my high honor and privilege to introduce the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden. Good job, Gary. Thank you. Please sit down. Mom, come on up for a minute. Come on. I want you to meet Gabe's mom, who I still believe is more like his sister than his mom. She is the inspiration. She is the reason why this young man has done such incredible things. And it's a simple lesson. My mother always told me, listen to your mom. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You deserve a great deal of praise. Thank you. Thank you. One other thing before I begin my formal remarks. I look out in the audience and I see so many people who have been in this battle for so long. But the one person who I know from personal experience, having been here for more than 40 years, who has been a champion when it was viewed as political uh, suicide to be a champion, was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Stein. There were many others behind her as well, but Nancy, not a joke. You were the one who started that fight in a way that you took it on with such passion. And it wasn't, it was not, it was viewed as a political death sentence to take this issue on at the time. But you did it. You fundamentally changed the way we looked at this. You even got George Bush to lead on this, too. 
No, but all kidding aside, you, I just want to personally, in front of all these people and all the world, thank you for your incredible work. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also joined by the second gentleman. He uh, is a hell of a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thank him for being here. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your leadership of HHS. I, uh, um, and I want to thank Gabe for sharing his story. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, you committed your life to this work, Gabe. I don't know whether you had that plan when you began it, but it's amazing what you've done. It's amazing what one person can do. It's an honor to meet with you both and learn more about the work that you're doing together to support your community. Folks, uh, we're also joined today by many who have been part of this effort for decades, including Dr. Fauci, who is, I, he, he's all things. <laughs> Doc, you're the best, and you never walk away from an issue or a problem. Thank you. And all of you have contributed so much to this mission of advocating for better prevention services for those at risk of getting HIV and uh, improved care services and living with HIV, breaking down the stigma and, from, and, and the disinformation that still exists around HIV AIDS. Uh, I want to thank you. Thank you for your voices and for putting your hearts into your work. Because that's what you do. You put your hearts into work, and people can tell. It's because of all of you and the dedication of scientists and activists uh, around the world that we've been able to dramatically reduce new HIV transmissions and make individuals with HIV uh, today lead long and healthy lives. And, you know, it's because of the persistence and resilience of the HIV community that we're changed so much about uh, the way we approach healthcare research and equitable access to services, even the relationship between patients and healthcare providers. You know, and it's because of you, and it's not hyperbole suggested, that we are within a striking distance of eliminating HIV transmission, within striking distance. And And I think everybody but Nancy couldn't have imagined this, us being there 40 years ago. But the fact is that uh, when CDC reported the first case that, uh, of what we now know as AIDS, it's something that we couldn't fully uh, imagine even 20 years ago, before the landmark investments that the United States made through PEPFAR and President's Emergency Plan for AIDS relief. But you made it possible. You made it possible, and I want to take this moment on this historic anniversary to acknowledge the incredible passion and the work that got us here. Because I know, I know that so many of you, uh, so, so many of you, this is personal. Today, uh, we once more raise uh, uh, a two-story tall red ribbon on the North Portico, the White House, to remember how far we've come, the work we have left to finish, and so we never forget the price the price that's paid all along the way. And so many of you know and relations with people who have, whether they're family members or friends, that you've watched them in the past wither away. In the past four decades, as has been mentioned, an estimated 36 million people, 36 million people, including more than 700,000 here in the United States, have died of AIDS-related illnesses. Think about that. That many people more than almost all the modern wars combined, all the wars combined. Here at home, we saw entire communities devastated by this disease, particularly among the LGBTQ plus individuals and members of racial and ethnic minority groups that they've already spoken to. And a generation endured the brunt, the brunt of this epidemic, losing friends, loved ones, family members, partners, instead of being seen and being recognized. And I can recall if you excuse the point of personal privilege, being, I think, in this very room, when a senator who, he's deceased now, so I don't want to mention his name because he can't defend himself, but standing up and saying, along with another guy named Jerry Falwell, this is God's punishment, paraphrasing it. God's punishment, finally. Think how much has changed. I mean, back in those days, the, the willingness of other members of the Senate and the House to stand up and take him on. It was Nancy was there, many of you were there. 
but it wasn't a universal thing. It wasn't a universal thing. But you all demand it. Demand to be treated with dignity and with equity. Those voices, those stories are invaluable as we recommit ourselves to finishing the fight that we are going to make for these individuals living with AIDS and are helping them drive and inform our efforts at every step of the way because we're going to finish this fight. And so when my administration came to office, not only, not only did we reestablish the White House Office of National AIDS Policy, which is hard to believe. I don't deserve any credit. That was the easiest possible thing to do. No, I really mean it. Think about it. Think about it, that it gets a round of applause in the year 2021 when we say that. I mean, it, it should have never, ever, well, I don't want to get into that. But anyway. <laughs> and I've asked Carol Phillips to lead our efforts. Carol, stand up. <laughs> Harold, I think they know you. Harold is de dedicated, uh, he has decades of experience working with, uh, uh, to end AIDS, the HIV epidemic, and I want to thank him for his leadership and willingness to, uh, to join the administration and releasing the National HIV AIDS Strategy for 2022 to 2025. That's, that's what he's doing. It's a roadmap for how we're going to put our foot on the gas and accelerate our efforts to end the HIV epidemic in the United States by the year 2030. That's the goal. And it centers on the kind of innovative community solutions, community-driven solutions that we know will work. It's a plan to make sure that the latest, the latest advances in HIV prevention, diagnosis, and treatment are available to everyone, regardless of their age, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, or other factors. It shouldn't matter where you live in the country or how much money you make or how you respond or how we, we have to respond across the board to HIV epidemic everywhere and support all people living with HIV. And critically, this strategy takes on a racial and gender disparities in our health system that for much too long have affected HIV outcomes in our country to ensure that our national response is a truly equitable response. So we're going to take aggressive action and back it up. We've asked Congress for $670 million in historic budget request for the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the United States Initiative. And I'm confident we're going to get that done. Right, team? <laughs> We've got some great congressional champions uh, for this work here today, starting with a woman, as I said, I've already mentioned, uh, uh, as she a uh, leader of the issue from the moment she uh, set foot in Congress, starting with Nancy, but also Representative Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee. <laughs> Maxine Waters. I learned a long time ago, when Maxine says, I have an idea, just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. And Sean Patrick Maloney. Sean. <laughs> Jennifer. David Cicilline. David. And Jennifer Gonzalez Cullen. <laughs> Thanks for all you're doing. I was going to say, not for your support. This is sui generis with all of you. You're just incredibly committed to this. And it's an issue that has a long history of bipartisan support. So looking forward to working across the aisle, God willing. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone in the United States knows their HIV status, that everyone with HIV receives high-quality care and treatment that they deserve, and that we end the harmful stigma around HIV and AIDS. In particular, there's still a large number of states that HIV have HIV criminalization laws that do not reflect an accurate understanding of HIV. For example, <laughs> HIV cannot be transmitted through saliva. 
There are still laws in the books that criminalize spitting by people with HIV. I mean, this is 2021, United States of America. But we have to follow science, and that means eliminating laws that perpetuate discrimination, exacerbate disparities, discourage HIV testing, and take us further away from our goal. We can do this. And as we accelerate our efforts at home, we're, we're not going to let up on the efforts to fight, fight HIV AIDS globally. Meeting reauthorization of PEPFAR in 2008 was among the highlights of my time as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And at the time, and by the way, I was not one of the great leaders in this. I, I always supported the effort, but it wasn't be, it was because I was chairman of the committee. And believe it or not, there was a Republican president, and I'm not being a wise guy when I say this, who uh, pushed for PEPFAR as an undeniable proof of the good that American leadership and innovation can achieve in the world when we commit to it. We have a moral obligation to do that and continue. Since President Bush launched PEPFAR in 2003, We've saved more than 21 million lives. We've prevented, <laughs> we've prevented millions of HIV infections, and we've helped at least 20 countries bring their HIV epidemics under control or reach their UN, UN AIDS 90-90-90 treatment targets. That means 90% of the people living with HIV in a country will know their HIV status. 90% of HIV-positive individuals are able to access treatment, and 90% of those receiving treatment for HIVs will have, will, will, will have uh, suppressed vi viral loads. That's within our power. We're doing that. And though PEPFAR, through PEPFAR, the United States will support nearly 19 million men, women, and children with life-saving HIV treatment. It's an incredible, incredible achievement. Those are not the only lives saved, though. They are their communities that are strengthened by the, by, by the talents and contributions of HIV-positive individuals who are here today leading productive lives and leading the community because of what you've all done. And as we have faced COVID-19 pandemic, we've also reaped additional benefits from our decades-long investment in strengthening health systems around the world through PEPFAR. Working through the CDC and USAID, PEPFAR supports more than 70,000 case care facilities, 3,000 laboratories, and nearly 300,000 healthcare workers across 55 countries, all of which have been vital in supporting the global fight against COVID-19. By strengthening countries' ability to fight AIDS, we've also improved our collective ability to fight other diseases. And I want to thank uh, uh, and recognize a guy that uh, I can't believe all he's done, Dr. John John King King Song King Gusong. I apologize, <laughs> Doc. Doc King Gusong, stand up. <laughs> Doc. Doc. Dr. King Gusong, you can call me Joe Biden. <laughs> But you're helping lead the important work of Omicron variant in, in his current role as director of African CDC, and who is my nominee for ambassador at large to oversee PEPFAR <laughs> and our global efforts to combat, combat HIV. I understand you're joined by Peter Sands. Peter, stand up, will you? Executive director, executive director of the Global Fund. This year marks 20 years of the Global Fund, and the United States is proud to be both a founding member of the fund and the largest contributor, and the United States is looking forward to hosting the Global Fund's seventh replenishment conference next year here. And so, thank you. We still have a difficult road ahead of us. We can't kid ourselves, particularly addressing the disparities we see both domestically and globally including the impact of high transmission rates among adolescent girls and young women. And today, as we look back in the past 40 years, where there's been so much pain and suffering, it's a testament to all, all the hard work represented in this room and around the world, that we're gathered today with hope in our hearts and for the future that's within our grasp. We can do this. We can do this. We can eliminate HIV transmission. We can get the epidemic under control here in the United States and in countries around the world. We have the scientific understanding, we have the treatments, and we have the tools we need. We're going to engage with people 
with, live, with lived experience with HIV and ensure that our efforts are appropriate and effective and centered around the needs of the HIV community, not us, centered around the needs of the community. And folks, together, we're going to save lives. I can imagine no higher calling to which we could be dedicated than our commitment to save lives. And this is the one area where we can get a lot more done quickly. So I want to thank you all again. I'm honored to be with you today. And this is one heck of a group of people who have hearts that are as big as their heads. And thank <laughs> God, thank God, have in those beautiful skulls so much knowledge and capacity. <laughs> So thank you, thank you, thank you. And when, uh, anyway, thanks.